The words for which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in the 8th chapter. It's this great story that we are still dealing with of Philip the Evangelist preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember how Philip, having done his great work in some area, was suddenly commanded by an angel to go down to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. And having done this, he suddenly sees a man sitting in a chariot. He was this Ethiopian eunuch, the treasurer of the court of the Queen of the Ethiopians. And he was returning from a visit where he'd been up to Jerusalem to worship. And he was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some men should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other men? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And you remember the end of the story, don't you? Here's the end of the story. When they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he, the eunuch, went on his way rejoicing. In other words, what we have here is the account of the conversion of this man. It's a part of this great story told in this chapter of the spread of the Christian faith in this Christian church from Jerusalem through Judea and down to Samaria, as our Lord had prophesied that it would do. But what is particularly fascinating about this particular instance is that it's the account of the conversion of the first African who became a Christian. And that in and of itself is of great interest and of great importance. But I am calling attention to it, let me remind you again. Not merely because we're interested in the story even of the Christian church or the spread of Christianity, although that is a very important subject. You don't begin to understand the story, the history of this world without the history of the Christian church. I mean, you take your secular history books. You can't understand them without understanding something about this church, the part she's played in it. That's the tragedy of the modern age. Modern men seems to think that history only started in 1900. He isn't aware of what's been happening throughout the centuries. It's because he's so intoxicated with his own importance, because he can split the atom, he doesn't realize that he's a part of history and that there's nothing new in his situation. That's his whole tragedy. So the history in itself is important. But I have something still more important to put to you. And that is that here in this story we are told uh, how a man becomes a Christian. That's the important thing here. And it's put in a very dramatic and uh, a very moving manner. We're all helped by illustrations, by stories, and by examples. And here we have a, a most notable example and illustration of how a man becomes a Christian. Now, my friends, these principles are eternal. There's only one way of becoming a Christian. The fact that this is the 20th century makes no difference at all. You become a Christian in the 20th century exactly in the same way as a man did in the 1st century. That's why this is so relevant to us. There's only one way. And it is because we are shown here what that one way is that I'm calling your attention to it. Now, we've been looking at this for some time and uh, the, the, some of the great difficulties, some of the stumbling blocks that trip and trap people uh, are here before us. You see, you've got to start with this whole notion of the supernatural. The modern man doesn't like that. He doesn't like anything that he doesn't understand, poor fellow. 
He measures everything by the measure of his own little mind. But here, you're in the realm of the supernatural and the eternal. In the same way, we've had a look at this man, uh, his picture of misery and of failure and of unhappiness. That's man without Christ. And then we've seen his utter inability, what an honest man he is. He's asked the question, understandest thou what thou readest? And his answer is, how can I except some men should guide me? There's no hope for a man until he comes to that. If you are still trusting to your own understanding, you'll remain exactly as you are. You'll remain a failure. The first thing you have to do is to become as a little child. It's our Lord who says this, except he be converted and become as little children. He shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. How can I, says this man? And then you see the story goes on. It's all about this 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah that he was reading there in his chariot. Do you understand it, says Philip? No, I don't, says the man. I don't understand it. How can I understand it except somebody should explain it to me? So he invites Philip into the chariot. And Philip, beginning with the very scripture that he was reading, begins to preach unto him Jesus. Now, this is it. You see, you become a Christian by believing the message of the Bible. And it doesn't matter very much where you start in it. Because it's a circle. And wherever you start, you're bound to go round. It's a complete whole. But the central message, of course, is the very one that is dealt with here. And it is, as I was pointing out a fortnight ago, this great message of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at it again in terms of the picture as we have given it here to look at together. What is necessary? Well, what is necessary for all of us is this, is first of all, to understand the message, and secondly, to see the relevance of that message to ourselves. Now, you see the importance of these two points. This Ethiopian eunuch was uh, not uh, a kind of philosopher who was just interested uh, to understand a passage of scripture. No, no, the man was concerned about himself. But he has a vague feeling that somehow or another this scripture has got something to do with him and something to say to him. And this is what is necessary for us. Here is this message about the death of Jesus Christ. We've got to know what it means. Yes, but still more important in a sense. We've got to see what it means to us. Now, let me ask you the question. Do you understand the meaning of uh, the death of Jesus Christ? You heard me announcing a communion service. What's the point of it? Are we just traditionalists here? Are we just doing this because it's been done for nearly 2,000 years? Is that it? Has it any significance? Has it any meaning? Is there any point in it in the modern world? Someone may say to me, oh, you're going to preach on the death of Jesus Christ. What on earth has that got to do with 1968? Look at the world we're in. Look what's happening in Vietnam. I want something to help me to live. I want something to give me an understanding. What on earth has the death of Jesus Christ nearly 2,000 years got to do with me? Well, if you are saying that, all I say to you is this. You obviously don't understand the death of Jesus Christ. Indeed, you've completely failed to understand it. I'm here to do what Philip did. I'm here to give you an understanding of this death. And I'm here to do that because it is the most important thing you can ever know. No man becomes a Christian without understanding something about the meaning of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is crucial to salvation. This is the message. Now, last time I showed you how people misunderstand this. There is nothing, there has been nothing that has been so misunderstood as the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. People are always ready to believe in him as a teacher, ready to follow him as an example. Anything but the death. This annoys them, it irritates them. And yet, whether we like it or not, it is crucial. 
I determine, says Paul to the Corinthians, not to know anything among you, said Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the heart and center of the gospel. That's why, of course, there is such misunderstanding with respect to it. Why is it that people are in trouble over this? Why do some dismiss it as a tragedy, an accident? Why does one put it simply down to the action of men? We, I've already been able to demonstrate to you that it is the action of God. It pleased the Lord. And our Lord himself was constantly repeating this and emphasizing this. It's not an accident. It's the action of God, not of men. And it is the action of God because it is God's way of providing salvation for us. But now men and women are in trouble about this. They can't understand this, they say. All right, they're like this Ethiopian eunuch. And I'm concerned to try to help those who still do not understand it. See, I can't see this. I can see the value of his teaching. I can see the value of his life. But you say the death that I've got to believe in, that death, I don't understand this. All right, now I, I just want to help you. And I'm going to help you like this. Let's go back again together to that passage that the man was reading, the 53rd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, the passage I read to you at the beginning. Now, Philip, I said, did two things. He, first of all, expounded the meaning of the passage. And then he showed the relevance of the passage to this man. But we've got to start with the meaning of the passage itself. The man who sees in trouble, he says, of whom is the prophet speaking? Is he speaking this about himself or of somebody else? Quite right, first question. And, uh, all right, we've got rid of that. He's not speaking of himself. It's a prophecy. He is speaking of Jesus, the one whom Philip begins to preach to him. But here, you see, is this great problem. This is the mystery to people. This is the thing that baffles them. This man and this which happens to him. Now, let me put it to you like this. In that 53rd chapter of Isaiah, there is a kind of paradox. You're obviously dealing with a very great person. And yet, there are things about him which seem to make him a very ordinary person. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. He's greater than all kings. And yet he's despised and rejected of men. Here it is. So you start, you see, with the person of whom the prophet Isaiah was writing. And the whole of Christianity is about this person. There is no such thing as Christianity apart from Christ. This person is the beginning and the end. Alpha, Omega, he's everything. He is the center. So you've got to start with him. And you see what uh, this uh, man Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch was? He preached to him Jesus. He told him about Jesus of Nazareth. And what he told him was that he was the Son of God. But that immediately raises the question, why, why does the Son of God come into this world? This is a great question that has baffled the ages. One of the most important books that has been written was a book that had that very title, Why God Man? Here's the central problem. See, this is the picture put in the 53rd of Isaiah. Here is this great and august person, but you see him dying in a most terrible way. What is the meaning of this? Why God man? Why did the eternal Son of God ever come to earth? That's the biggest question of all. Now, you see, this becomes important in this way. There is only one ultimate reason why anybody is in difficulty about the cross, about the death of Jesus Christ. And that is, they have never realized the depth of the human problem, the human situation. That's the whole trouble. 
And uh, that is why it is always necessary to preach the law and to preach sin before you preach the gospel. So you're saying to people, come to Jesus. They don't come to Jesus. Why not? They've never seen any need of Jesus. People don't understand the cross and they can't see why it's necessary because they've never understood the human problem. They've never seen the depth and the profundity of the problem. You see, what they ask is this. All right, they say, we're prepared to admit that we're not perfect. We're not all as we should be. But they say, surely it would have been sufficient to send teachers to us. Surely what men needs is to be taught, to be given instruction. Surely what we need is an example. And they say, all right, we'll even admit that we are sinners and that we have sinned against God. But surely, they say, even if that is so, all that is necessary is that God in his love should forgive us. They say, why all this about the death and the crucifixion and why do you say it's essential? Now, this is how people argue. Haven't you argued like that? They say, all right, I'll admit it, I am a sinner. I've sinned against God. But surely, if I go to God and say, I have sinned against you, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. Have mercy upon me, give me forgiveness. Surely, God in his love will forgive you. But they say, you people say that he can't do that, that he doesn't do that. You say that Christ has got to come into the world and he's got to suffer and he's got to die on a cross before God can forgive me. I don't understand this exactly. Understandest thou what thou readest? Because what you read is that the Son of God has come into this world, that he's humbled himself, that he's left the courts of heaven and that he was born in a stable. The world saw nothing in him. Worked as a carpenter, poverty. The world didn't understand him. It's all there in Isaiah 53. You've read it and you heard me reading it at the beginning tonight. But this is it. This is what has happened. And he has come into the world and he has been born as a babe and he has lived as a man. Now here is the great question. Why did this have to happen? Why cannot we be forgiven? Merely by God in his love saying, I forgive you. That's the problem. That's the difficulty. Why all this that you read of in Isaiah 53 and in the New Testament Gospels? Well, you see, there's only one answer to this. It is obvious, isn't it? That mere teaching is not enough. And that God, I say it with reverence, obviously, could not just say, I forgive you. For it is clear that if he could, he would have done that. But that isn't what he's done. What I'm told he's done is this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sent his son into this world, and the son came in this way. What is he doing? Well, now, it's here, you see, you begin to understand the human problem. There is something about the problem of every one of us by nature that nothing can solve except the coming of the Son of God from heaven and glory into this world. If it could have been done in any other way, it would have been done in any other way. God raised up prophets, he raised up teachers, he gave a lawgiver, he gave a law, all that was done it didn't work. So when the fullness of the times was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that are under the law. Very well, he comes into the world. What's he doing by coming? Well, what he's doing is this. He is taking unto himself human nature. He's God. He's eternal God. He's the Son. But he is born of a virgin. Born of the virgin's womb. What's happened? He has taken human nature unto himself. 
He adds manhood to his Godhead. He is God and men. This is what's happening. Why does he do this? He does this to identify himself with us. So, you see, you get that paradox at the end of uh, Isaiah 52 and running through Isaiah 53. This extraordinary contradiction between this high and august person and this weak person. But that is the paradox of Jesus Christ. He's God. He's man. He's able to do anything. Miracles are nothing to him. And yet, he's very weak. And he dies in weakness. Here it is. Who is this man writing of, says this man? Ah, he's not writing of himself, says Philip. He's writing of Jesus. So he tells him about Jesus of Nazareth. God, man, what's he doing? Why is the Son of God come into the world? The answer is he has come into the world to identify himself with us. He's come because of the human predicament, because of the human problem, because of the state of the world, because of mankind individually. He says the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what he's doing here, and he can only do this, not by coming down and telling us how to live and giving us an ex No, no, he's identifying himself with us. He does that by taking our nature upon him. But he doesn't stop at that. You remember that he went to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was calling people to repentance. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And one day Jesus Christ goes to him and offers himself to be baptized and John says, but I'm not the man to baptize you. You ought to be baptizing me. You've never sinned. You have no need to be baptized. You have no need of repentance. Suffer it to be so now, says our Lord to him. I've got to be. I can't do my work unless I take my place with these people. You see, it's a part of the identification of himself. This is the only way to understand this teaching. This is the only way of salvation. It isn't a mere word from God. It is the Son of God coming down in full identification of himself with us. So he takes his place by our side as a sinner among sinners, though he's never sinned. And he says, I must be baptized. And he was baptized. Still more amazing. After his baptism, we read that he was subject to temptation in the wilderness. 40 days and 40 nights. Now you will read in the epistle of James that God neither tempteth any man nor can be tempted. This is obvious, isn't it? It's axiomatic. God cannot be tempted by evil. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. It is inconceivable that evil could tempt God. It cannot. But here is the Son of God tempted in all points like as we are. What's its meaning? Oh, it is just this identification of himself with us. Why did the Son of God come into the world, I ask again? There's only one answer. He came in order that he might be our representative. There is that about our condition that makes it essential for him to become one of us, as it were. And this is what he's done. He has identified himself with us. He has taken our place. He stands up as our representative. My friend, if he hadn't done this, we'd all be damned. We are without hope. We are lost. We need someone who can take our burdens and problems and handle them. And this is what he's done. Very well, now there's the beginning of it. That's just a general view of this blessed person that is held before us in that amazing portion of scripture that this poor Ethiopian eunuch was reading there on the road. You're not so surprised now that he didn't understand, are you? We none of us understand it by nature. All your scientific knowledge doesn't help you here. All your philosophy is useless at this point. 
This is the mystery of mysteries, the mystery of godliness, the mystery of God. Understand, of course not. All you do is to look at him and you listen to the message concerning him and here it is. But let me go on. The next thing, of course, that not merely strikes us but really hits us in that 53rd chapter of Isaiah is his suffering. It's a terrible picture of suffering. And the Ethiopian eunuch doesn't understand this. What does this mean? Well, what comes out, of course, everywhere is the way in which he suffered in his life in this world. This is how it's put. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. That's the picture. And it is, of course, the picture of him everywhere in the, in, in the New Testament Gospels. Look at him. Look at this Jesus. Listen, says this man, Philip, to the Ethiopian eunuch. The one who's being described there prophetically by the prophet Isaiah is none other than this Jesus. You've heard of him when you've been up in Jerusalem. The news of him has gone abroad. This is Jesus. Look at him. This was the truth concerning him. He was a man of sorrows, and he was acquainted with grief. But why? He was pure. He never did any wrong. He never sinned. Why was he a man of sorrow? But he was. Has it ever occurred to you to notice that you're never told that he ever laughed? We're not even told that he smiled. Why not? Oh, I'm telling you, it's the depth of the human problem. He's come from heaven because of it. It's such a terrible problem that it's necessitated that Smiling, laughing, joking, the unthinkable, man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Have a look at him. Even as a little boy, age 12, he's already beginning to feel the burden. He was taken up to Jerusalem. It was their custom to go up at given times, and he was taken up. And then they went back on their journey. And they'd gone a day's journey and looked for him. They couldn't find him. They saw, they supposed that he was in the company, but he wasn't there. So uh, Joseph and Mary go back to Jerusalem to look for him. And there they find him in the, the temple, arguing and reasoning with the doctors of the law. What, a boy age 12? Yes, but what's he doing? And they, they chide him, you remember, and reprimand him. They say, what are you doing here? Why didn't you come with us? And he answers them, saying, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business, about the things of my father? This boy, age 12. This isn't mere precocity, it's something beyond that. What's happening? Oh, my father's business. The burden of man in sin, the burden of the fall, the burden of a world lost and going to destruction, the things of my father, all this worship, all this means of reconciliation, the things of my father. He is already, though by age twelve, a man of sorrows, older than his years. Indeed, you remember we are told about him at the end of the eighth chapter of the the Gospel according to St. John, that having said, Before Abraham was, I am, and the Father and I are one, they said, Who is this who talks like this? You're not yet fifty years old, they said. You know, they thought that he was getting on for that, though he was just over thirty. What was this? Oh, it's this burden. These paintings of our Lord, they're all wrong. That's why you should never put them up. They're all imagination. And they're imagination generally of artists who are not spiritually minded men. They've got him wrong altogether. His visage was marred. He wasn't the type of one depicted in the pictures. No one should ever try to represent him. He was burdened. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. But then, 
You remember the account of their temptation in the wilderness. And there it went on for 40 days and 40 nights. And then we are told a very interesting thing, that when the temptations had ceased, that angels came and ministered unto him. Why do you think that happened? What do you think was happening there? Why was he in need of being ministered unto? My dear friend, this is the whole tragedy of the world. Man thinks his problems are political and social. They're not. They're the problems of hell. They're the problems of the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, of spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. What was the matter with him? He was struggling with the devil and the forces of hell. And though he is the son of God in the flesh, the struggle was so tremendous that he needs the ministration of angels. But all this he does that you and I might be delivered, that you and I might be saved. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. And it involves a conflict with these powers. We talk lightly about sin and falling to temptation and we get up and we go on. Oh, have you ever seen the power, the malignity, the awfulness? He met it directly. Here you begin to see something about this depth. That's why he was a man of sorrows. He looked out upon mankind and we are told that he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Oh, how sorry he was. He says, there they are, they don't know, they don't understand. They know nothing about these powers that are manipulating them and playing with them as if they were but marbles, and they're nothing. They don't know it, but he felt the power, and this is the power that's got us down. This is the power that's ruined the world. This is the thing he's come to deal with. Here's the depth of the problem. And it comes out there in their temptation in the wilderness. But it comes out everywhere. You remember his ministry of healing and so on. And this is what I read about it in the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. You know, I think we haven't begun to understand all this. I plead guilty myself. I and all of us tend to look at him as this eternal Son of God with power and majesty and might that can cast out devils and deal with diseases. There's nothing he cannot do. But it wasn't as easy as that. Himself took our infirmities and bare our diseases. Did you know that as he healed these people, somehow or another, I don't understand this, this is a mystery, but this is what it's saying. Somehow or another, they became part of him. He bore them himself. Sin and infirmities and sicknesses are all the result of sin and of the fall. And he's come to deal with this. And all this becomes a part of him. And he suffered. That's why he was a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. Take another example. Have you ever noticed this? You've read, haven't you, the story of how he healed the son of that man at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration. Our Lord and Peter and James and John had gone up onto the mountain. There he'd been transfigured before them, and that amazing scene had taken place. But when they came down from the mount, they saw a great concourse of people surrounding the other disciples. And there was a poor man there with his boy. A boy who was having some strange fits. And the man, our Lord, says, What's this all this about? And the man said, I have brought my son unto thee, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and formeth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I brought him to thy disciples, that they should cast him out, and they could not. Then listen, this is what I read. He answereth him, and saith, 
O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. But why did he use those expressions? How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? He's got all power. He knows what he can do. Yes, but it costs him. He's suffering. The power of evil. He's ever conscious of this. So it's an illustration of the same thing. Or take a final example of this. Do you remember our Lord was going one day at the request of a man called Jairus to heal his daughter who was dead. And a great crowd was round and about him. And he was in a hurry to go to Jairus' house. But the crowd was so great he was held up. And in the crowd there was a poor woman who'd got an illness. And in a sudden flash she realized that he could heal her. And she realized that he was so powerful that there was no need for her even to ask him. She said to herself, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. So there she was. I don't know why the secrecy. There may have been an element of shame in her disease. And she didn't want anybody to know. So she says to herself, I'm going to touch but the hem of his garment and I'm going to be healed. And she touched him. He was surrounded, literally thronged by people. And our Lord suddenly says, who touched me? And his astonished disciples say, are you saying who touched you? The whole world is touching you. You say, who touched me? Oh yes, he says, I am saying, who touched me? He was aware that a particular individual had touched him. How was he certain of this? This is how he puts it. Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. You and I, I say, tend to think of him as this peerless, almighty son of God. And he can do this, and he can do that, and he could. But remember, it cost him. Virtue, some power, some energy, something has gone out of him. And everything he does costs him. That's what we are told in Isaiah 53. He is a man of sorrows, and he is acquainted with grief. And he suffers in this world. He went on like that. Now let me bring you a question, a conundrum. We are, we are 20th century people, aren't we? And we are men of great understanding. I'm going to ask you a question. The question that uh, Philip put to this Ethiopian eunuch. I'm going to test your understanding. Now the poor eunuch was dealing with Isaiah 53 which all expositors will agree is an extremely difficult uh, passage of scripture to expound. We have every sympathy with the Ethiopian eunuch. But now I'm going to give you a very simple problem. I'm going to ask you to expound a verse of two words. It's the shortest verse in the whole of the scripture. Jesus wept. Do you understand it? Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the scripture. Understandest thou what thou readest? Oh, yes, you say, quite simple. All right, what is it? Well, you remember the context, don't you? This happened at the grave of a man called Lazarus, who was a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'd been dead for four days. And it is there, standing by that grave, that we are told that Jesus wept. There, standing by him, were the two sisters of this man Lazarus, Martha and Mary. And there were other people weeping also and bewailing their loss. But Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? You say, quite simple. He has lost a great friend. And it's very natural that when one loses a bosom friend, one should be filled with sorrow. And he was but a man after all, and he wept as others weep. All right, there's one prophet explanation. Well, then says somebody else, but not only that. He wept also because of his sympathy with the sisters. They've lost this darling brother. And there he is. It's only natural that he should be sympathetic towards them. Well, I mustn't keep you. 
But your explanations, my dear friend, are all wrong. I can prove this to you quite simply. And I prove it like this. Check me when you go home. You'll find the account in the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. This is how I prove that your proffered explanations are wrong. The first answer I give is this. That when our Lord was first told about the illness of his friend Lazarus, instead of going there immediately to heal him, he deliberately didn't go and delayed his going. Deliberately. Check, my, check the account when you go home. That's my first answer. And he even gives the reason for not going. His disciples were pressing him to go. He says, no, no. He says, this is all for the greater glory of God. So he deliberately doesn't go to save the man's life. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that he said to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and so on. So there is the first answer, but there is a greater answer, of course, which is this. That when our Lord did go there to the grave, he knew perfectly well that he was going to raise this man, Lazarus. He says, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. He goes in order to raise Lazarus from the dead. Well, if he knows he's going to raise him from the dead, why waste time in weeping because he's dead? Why waste uh, tears in sympathy with the, door, with, the bride, with the sisters? Because he knows that the next moment he's going to restore Lazarus to them. No, 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 that isn't why Jesus wept. Why did he weep? It's still the same reason. It's the reason why he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It's not natural human sympathy. It's not concern about the loss of his friend. Do you know what it was? No, no. He says this terrible thing, this death, this thing that comes in and robs a man of his friends and sisters of their brother, this thing that breaks people's hearts and spoils life. Oh, this horrible thing. What is it? Is it the cause of nature? No, no. It is sin. It is evil. It is hell. It's the devil. It's this thing that is fighting my father. This is the thing. He sees it there and it makes him weep. Not only that, he realized there that before he could deal with it, he'd got to die himself. So never interpret Jesus wept sentimentally. It isn't. It's this horror of sin. It's this horror of evil. It is this terrible problem of the human race. This is the thing. It's there in the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. It wasn't the only time I read in John 12, the next chapter. Just again as he's dealing with this whole question of his death, he says, Now is my soul troubled. Indeed, I should have pointed out to you that there, in this very, over this very question of the resurrection, or the resuscitation, rather we should call it, of Lazarus, we read here when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Why? He knew he was going to raise him. It is, I say, because of this terrible evil problem, the thing that gets us down and makes us fools and makes us slaves of sin and that causes death. It's this thing that's raised itself up against God, the ruination of God's universe. He sees it and realizes he's got to die. So there again he says, Now is my soul troubled. Follow him on and you'll find that this continues. Look at him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember the hymn we sang just now? Garden of Gethsemane. Look at him again there. What's the matter? 
takes Peter and James and John with him. He says to them, stay here for a while, pray for me. I need your help. I'm passing through an agony. And he goes on alone. And there he is in an agony and he sweats drops of blood. But what's the meaning of this? Why this? Why this agony? Why this groaning? Why this breaking of spirit, as it were? What is this? That's what you've got to explain. That's what you've got to understand. It all comes out in Isaiah 53. His visage was marred. He's passing through an agony. He's touching depths that no man has ever known. Never has there been such suffering. What is this? Read the accounts of the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the same thing. It's this awful problem of sin. It's this awful problem of the human race that he's come to deal with. And he's got to feel the full force of it. He does. He's the representative. And so, you see, you come to this description of him in Isaiah 53, where we are told this, that he was uh, like a lamb brought to the slaughter. And as a sheep before a shearer is his dumb, so he opens not his mouth. Poor Ethiopian eunuch, he says, I don't understand this. I don't follow this. He's done no wrong. He's done no harm. There's nothing against him. Why doesn't he defend himself? Why doesn't he prove that he's done no wrong? Why does he allow all this to be said and suffer in silence like a lamb brought to the slaughter? Why? There's only one answer. He is not dealing with men. He is not dealing with human courts. He knows he's dealing with a vaster and a profounder problem. You remember what he said to Pilate? Pilate, he said, don't talk to me about your authority. You have no authority except that which is given you from above. You don't know what you're doing. You're signing a chit. You're signing just this thing which gives them authority to crucify me, my dear men. You're nobody. You're merely a little scribe. You're a big man, you think. You're a Roman governor. You're a nobody. You're a clerk. You're a mere official. You are doing nothing to me. It's God. So he opened not his mouth. This is a part of it. But come to the end of the story. Look at him on the cross. What stands out? Well, I say, what stands out is this exceptional suffering. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and is for more than the sons of men. There has never been such suffering as that endured by the Son of God on the cross. I thirst, he says. The thieves crucified one each side of him. They didn't say that. But listen to him. He cries out in an agony, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's the question for you. Why did he say that? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There are some people, you know, who would have us believe that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was the death of a martyr. Well, all I can say is this. If it is the death of a martyr, he is greatly inferior to the martyrs. I've never heard of a martyr crying out in agony on his cross or standing on a pile to be burned, or being hanged, I've never heard of a martyr who cries out in agony, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What's the story of the martyrs? I'll tell you the story of the martyrs. There they are on the stake. The wood is all in position. They see the man standing, the executioner, with a flame in his hand, and he's only got to put the flame to the wood, and soon the flames will be lapping round his body and burning him and charring him. He knows the agony is going to be indescribable. What's he do? Does he cry out, My God, my God, where hast thou forsaken me? Quite the reverse. He smiles. Some of them put their hands in first like Rembo. They make great speeches. They thank God they're accounted worthy. Complaining never. They say, it's all right. I'm just being ushered into heaven. They die gloriously. Why? Well, because God is with them. 
Because God is upholding them, because God is sustaining them. They say, I'm not afraid, man can't do anything to me, I'm in the hands of God. So they pass through the flames, triumphing and flying. But here is one who cries out in agony. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And he was forsaken. It was true. Now, my friend, this is the thing you've got to answer. Why was he forsaken of God? Why the cry of dereliction? Answer me another question. Why did he die so soon? The count tells us that when the soldiers came just to see how these three who had been crucified were, remember, crucifixion was a very slow way of dying. They were amazed to find that he was already dead. They were astounded at this. And then you remember the soldier came and thrust his spear into the side, and out there came water and blood, which means blood clot and plasma. The blood had already separated into the clot and the plasma, the liquid. And they're amazed at this. What's the explanation? Understandest thou what thou readest? That's what you're reading of in Isaiah 53. You are reading of the most intense suffering that has ever been known in the world or ever will be known. What accounts for it? He died of a broken heart, literally. Hence the clot and the plasma, the serum. What's the cause of it? There's only one answer, you know. And it's the whole answer. He was tasting death for every man. What was happening was this. He was here dealing with this problem of man in sin. It was all on him, not his own because he was innocent, he was guiltless. But it was all on him. The Father had laid it all on him. He is bearing, do you know what he's bearing? He is bearing all the sufferings of hell. He is bearing the full outpouring of the vials of God's wrath upon sin in his own person. The agony, the suffering is so intense it's inconceivable. The pains of hell get hold of him. It is, I say, the concentrated wrath of God upon sin. That's the explanation of Isaiah 53. What suffering? Do you understand it now, says Philip to the Ethiopian? This isn't Isaiah, this isn't a man. No man could ever suffer like this. This is Son of God suffering. Well, how does Son of God suffer like this? He does this because it is the only way whereby you can be forgiven. The chastisement of your peace was on him. My dear friend, said Philip to this man, this is not something merely of historical interest. This is the only thing that can save you from the punishment of hell. The only thing. Nothing else. That's why he came. That's why he was a man of sorrows. That's why he was acquainted with grief. That's why he endured, he suffered all this. That you might not suffer. That you might be reconciled to God. That all your sins might be blotted out as a thick cloud. But that is what it meant for him. That is what it cost him. That is what he came willingly to do. The Son of God has so loved you that he's done that for you. And it is the only way whereby any man can become reconciled to God and receive the forgiveness of sins and begin to live a new life in this world and go on to the certain knowledge that he shall spend his eternity 
in the glorious presence of eternal God. I leave you then with the question. Do you understand Isaiah 53? Do you understand the meaning of the death of Christ, the Son of God, and the cross? But still more urgently. Do you realize what it means for you? Can't you see that your whole eternal future depends upon your understanding and your knowledge of this? That the Son of God has loved you and given himself for you. You believe and know this and you're already delivered from this present evil world. Whatever it may do to you, whatever may happen, it doesn't matter. You're a son of God, you're a child of God. You're safe in life, in death and to all eternity. Do you understand it? Do you believe it? I can easily test you. If you do... Like the Ethiopian eunuch, you will have a joy in your heart as you leave this service tonight, which you've never had in your life before. Understandest thou what thou readest? Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.